Father, I thank you for everything of what you did for us through your son. Father, I ask that you will quicken to me and to everybody under the sound of my voice, uh, the truth about Jesus and what he has already freely provided for us. Father, show us how to rightly divide what we read in the Bible and what we know to be true through the old covenant lens. And so we can remain under that new covenant and in that finished work where we are seated with you in heavenly places. Father, I thank you also that Jesus said that just go forth and preach my word and signs and wonders will follow my word. Um, and I thank you, Father, that signs and wonders will follow the preaching and the teaching of Jesus, that whatever breakthrough you need, if you need healing in your physical body, if you need fruitfulness to manifest, Father, I thank you just at hearing your word, just at hearing about Jesus and his finished work will be more than enough for us to experience that supernatural breakthrough that we need. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, well, today I'm going to be continuing in our uh, series on uh, prayer. And so we sort of, it, it just sort of all, if I can use this word organically, <laughs> became a prayer series. We just really had some messages we felt on our heart to share. And uh, with other things we just shared around that, it ended up being, well, we're talking about prayer now. So we are... Um, excited about that and there's a few other ones that we'd like to share with you just so we can complete this series we did uh, i think it was around 2015 we did a series on prayer at church and we've released the audios um so they are, are already up there on my website which is nerritowalker.cartland.com however we're going to be redoing them and having them uh, freely available on our youtube channel so that you can watch them, that you can see the scriptures and uh, really so that you can watch it back and you can pause it and study the word for yourself. Um, when it comes to prayer uh, and Jesus finished work, it's a really huge mind shift. There is first a lot that we need to unlearn before we can really grasp the simplicity of prayer as a new covenant believer, um, and which is really, it is a shame. And it's a shame that so many people have misunderstood this because um, I've personally found that prayer became something that was, you know, there were so many rules and regulations to prayer. You know, you've got the, the petition prayer, you've got the prayer of faith, you've got, you know, all these other prayers and there's all these conditions around it, like the laws of faith, if you like, or the works of faith. But, but something that is meant to be so simple, I don't know why man has made it so complicated. So with that said, I just want to get into my message today. So prayer and Jesus finish work. There we go. So just um, to help you in what I'm going to be sharing on today, um, last week I shared on God's sovereignty and prayer. And prior to that, I shared two messages. And that was, we're going to package that, those three messages as a separate series on our YouTube channel that somebody can watch as a playlist. And it's called, Is God in Control of Everything That Happens in Our Lives? Or Is God in Control? So if you look for something along those lines of that title, you'll be able to find those three messages. And then prior to that, Sean did two messages on the two well-known prayer parables about the unjust judge and the widow and the prayer, uh, I mean, sorry, the uh, parable of the man who came to his friend at midnight. And Sean unraveled both of those and he showed you um, how uh, with that parable that Jesus actually wasn't teaching a model way to pray. Uh, you know, it wasn't like just, you know, it was a, I'm not going to go too far into that. You can watch those two on our church YouTube channel. But he, he was sharing how Jesus was contrasting uh, God compared to an unjust judge. You know, why would anybody compare God to an unjust judge in the first place is beyond me. You know, and even with the friend at midnight, you know, and he, he their friend comes and knocks at the door. And when we think about just that whole parable, you know, when you pull back and start to rightly divide things by looking at who is saying what to whom and why, things like that, you see that there was a father in the house. Uh, he said, you know, he was pretty annoyed at first because he said, my children are asleep. So, and the friend comes and knocks at the door. Why would we put ourselves as the friend knocking at the door? 
under the new covenant, we're children. We are already in the house. We're already asleep. We're already provided for. It's someone on the outside knocking to come in. <laughs> Hello. So it's I encourage you to watch both those messages to really learn to rightly divide what we've read in the Bible and start to unlearn the stuff we've been taught about prayer and how God works or how God doesn't work. Now, on my personal YouTube channel, which if you just type in youtube.com forward slash Nerida Walker, you will find um, my own personal YouTube channel for what I do with New Life Ministries. And uh, there's two messages I did last th this year on uh, my live video recordings, and that's on the prayer of faith and the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you haven't seen those, I encourage you to do so because there's a whole lot of principles that I shared on um, prayer and on faith that will help you to, to continue to rightly divide what you read in the Bible and to continue to unlearn man-made traditions and doctrines about prayer and about how God works and about how God doesn't work. And uh, I think that's a lifelong journey. I'm still unlearning. I've still got to remind myself about what we have in Jesus finished work. Now, just briefly, I want to just briefly, briefly summarize what we shared last week on prayer and God's sovereignty, because it does kind of tie in with what I'm sharing today. So I, I just thought if someone has just stumbled across this message and hasn't seen that, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taster of what we shared last week. So you can go back and watch that message but the bottom line, what we share, I think, in every message, don't we, is that God is only ever and always good. Only good and perfect gifts come from God, James 1.17 says. Acts 10.38 tells us that Jesus was an anointed by God. And what did he do? He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And we know that God sent Jesus to destroy the devil's work. The devil has been sinning breaking the commands of God from the beginning, we're told, but Jesus came to destroy his work and that God's plans for us are only to prosper us, never to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future. So we need to be established in the goodness of God and uh, not in the traditions and the doctrines of men. Uh, I, I think I can say amen and go home now. <laughs> That's essentially what we our aim to teach and for you to come to that that conclusion in everything you face in your life so god's sovereignty as we went through last week and this this is just an overview um, so you will need to go and watch those three messages to understand uh, this summary today but the bottom line is god's sovereignty does not mean that god is in control of both good and evil okay god the reality is god is not controlling the daily outcomes or our daily choices that's not how God operates at all. He gave us authority, but God's sovereignty is his redemption over evil, having already restored what was lost at the fall. Okay, so this is one thing. This is a huge mindset shift for a lot of believers. God does not control or God does not allow evil. Okay, <laughs> God sent Jesus to disarm evil, to destroy evil. So let's break that down really briefly for you. So Jesus, remember when Jesus came here, uh, um, God came as Jesus, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus, what did he do? He gave us his power and authority, what to do? To rule and to reign over evil, essentially, is what he did. Matthew 10, 1, Luke 9, 1, he says that I give you, um, I give you power to cast out all unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Luke 10, 19, he says, Behold, I give you power to tread and trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall harm you. So Jesus gave us his power and authority to rule and to reign over evil. He then took evil and he disarmed it on the cross. And I've got Galatians 3.13 on my notes there. He redeemed us from that curse of the law and of sin and death. And we have been delivered Colossians, that should say Colossians 1, 13 to 14, by the way. But Colossians 2, 13 to 14 also talks about him disarming the powers and the principalities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that stood and opposed to us. Jesus has set us free. Salvation means deliverance. 
Salvation in, in Greek, soteria, means deliverance. Deliverance from death, from sin and death, and from all your enemies, okay? You have been delivered from evil. Then when Jesus ascended, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out and given freely uh, to everyone. So ever since, that's the beginning of that, um, the fullness of that new covenant that so what every believer has is God's very spirit, the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He continues to equip and empower us to, to advance God's kingdom, which is what? To continue to rule and reign over evil. Amen. So this is God's sovereignty in a nutshell. So God's sovereign absolutely over creation and restoration. So over creation at the beginning, he wasn't in control of when Adam fell, but he was in control of when he restored what Adam lost through the Garden of Eden, uh, through Jesus and his finished work. So man stuffed up, but God stepped in and redeemed and restored that situation, gave us back authority through Jesus. And, uh, and now we have authority as we rule and reign in this fallen world. And I've said here in my notes that God is not sovereign over our daily choices because he's given us free will and he's given us authority. He restored that authority that was given to Adam and Eve where he said, have dominion over all of the earth to rule and reign over it, et cetera, et cetera. And it says, so God's not sovereign over, over our daily choices and outcomes. We are. Okay, and that's the biggest uh, misunderstanding in the body of Christ today, I believe, because everybody believes that God is in control of everything that happens, but that makes us powerless. Um, we just sit back and just really what we're doing is saying, hey, Sarah, Sarah, whatever happens, happens. You know, religion says, well, well it was, wasn't God's will that didn't happen that way or, you, you know, that it happened that way or maybe he's got another plan, et cetera, et cetera. That is not the truth, and I hope you can understand that so the bottom line over god's sovereignty is god is not in control of both good and evil he dealt with evil and got disarmed it on the cross then gave us his power and authority to rule and to reign over evil amen so uh that is so exciting so that i think we need to understand that that will help you in your prayer life uh even just that knowledge alone but we're just going to redefine prayer before we talk about Jesus' finished work and how it fits into prayer because that it's just been a hugely misunderstood subject what prayer is. So what I was taught about prayer and what most people believe that prayer is, is that God is reactive, okay? And we can tell that by how we relate to God, even before we even open our mouth, what we're thinking about God and when we face something. So, because what are we thinking God's going to do? You know, you start that process. So I just want to get you to stop and think because that's what we've been taught, that God is reactive so that we pray, we hit a situation, we pray, um, and then God hears and then God responds. So that's how a lot of believers see how prayer works. But the reality is God is proactive. He's not reactive, he's proactive. God has already responded to every prayer need we could possibly have through what he did through his son, through the finished work of the cross. And that is the reality. And we're going to break that down as we go through this message. So that's, I've just made th these points really simple for you so that you can um, rightly divide what you read in the Bible and bring yourself back to the simplicity of, of what prayer is under the finished work of the cross. So within that first um, point there that God is reactive, that when many people go to God, they believe that then God responds through uh, one of three ways is he either says yes or no or wait. And then what we get by that is a lot of people uh, sitting there waiting for God to move, waiting. And then what happens with us, and we'll go through that a bit further today, is that where does that leave us? Because we end up in this lack mentality and then we end up trying to work out ways that we can somehow try to reach God, somehow try to get God to move. Um, so really, we do get manipulative. If I'm going to be honest with myself, how, you know, really what, we're, what I'm saying when I have that thought is, how can I manipulate to get what I want here? Because what do I, what is it going to take to get you to move, to get this answer? 
you know, how do I par- bypass the yes or the no or the wait, you know, and then either you just think, well, it's not his will. And, and it's just, um, there's so many doctrines have been formed out of these two belief systems. But God's answers, uh, we know that uh, 2 Corinthians one twenty tells us that all the promises of God are yes and amen, which and amen means so be in Christ. The New Living Translation of this scripture says all the promises of God have been fulfilled in Christ. So Jesus is God's yes answer to you. And that's why I say that Jesus is God's answer to everything we could ever face while we live in this fallen world that we already have everything we need for our breakthrough. Other people believe, uh, this is just what general, um, in general Christendom, that we believe that prayer, it's about, re- at the end of the day, it's waiting on God's sovereignty because God is in control. But I've just defined God's sovereignty from last week's lesson. But just to summarize it again here for the point of this slide here, is that God, always remember, he created us in his very image and his very likeness. And he gave us his power and authority over all the works of his hands. This earth was created and man was created for this earth to rule, to reign, to tend and guard and keep it. God didn't say, I am going to rule and reign it through you. He didn't say every time you want to reproduce, you need to come and ask me for my will. And if it's my will for you to have babies or not. No, God created everything at creation, the plants, the birds, the fish, uh, and every creeping thing, including man, Adam and Eve, God created everything that they needed to continue to see creation reproduce, to procreate, okay, love that word, to procreate, and that still functions today, you know, so we still have dominion, power, and authority. We know the fall took place, but Jesus restored what was lost at the fall so we need to really grow up in our finished work and our thinking renew our mind and our thinking to know that the father has given us authority over this fallen world you know i'm not saying we bypass god in any way shape or form because it's through relationship it's because we believe in jesus that we have this ability so it's always about relationship and also revelation that we're not here on our own, we're not as orphans, but God has sent us his spirit that we can live and walk and talk with him and allow him to lead us in our day-to-day lives. And so in short, most people believe that prayer is at the bottom, the bottom line is prayer is all about God hearing and then responding to us. But under the new covenant, prayer is communion. Prayer is communion. I, you know, if you haven't uh, watched that message yet, I did three part message on communion. The first one, I shared a message called communion and how it's more than a meal. I encourage you to watch that to show the relationship that we now have uh, through Jesus and the finished work. So prayer is communion and prayer is all about us hearing and then responding to God, not the other way around, because God has already responded. God already sent Jesus and dealt with everything that we would face while living in this fallen world. The, and you hear me say this all the time. The only thing we are lacking under our new covenant is revelation on what God has already done. And then just then just the, the lack of knowledge of knowing how to see that manifest you know, what to do, what not to do in regards to our personal circumstances. And that, once again, is through relationship where we're hearing and responding. So the Father can guide and to lead us in how we see that take place. It's exciting. And really, when you break prayer down, it it really is so simple. But the definition of prayer, the New American um, Standard Exhaustive Concordance, Uh, this is the information I've got from there is that the word pray is Strong's number 4336 and it is pro acumai and it comes from two words pro and acumai and uh, I'm hope I've uh, pronounced that correctly (laughs) so pro in helps word studies means properly towards a uh, properly motion towards or to interface with literally moving toward a goal or destinations it indicates an extension towards a goal with implied interaction and 
reciprocity. I think I pronounced that right. With look at this with presumed contact and reaction. Prayer is not a monologue, it is a dialogue. Okay. So naturally, it suggests the cycle of initiation and response. What is it? Hearing and responding. There's a connection, there's a communion that's taking place there. So that's the word pro. Acumai is. Uh, it means just a wish, an offer, a request, a pray or wish for is how that is translated in our English. So pro acumi, pray, Helps Word Studies then says of this word, the two together. So pro again is towards exchange and acumi to wish to pray. So therefore it means, properly it means to exchange wishes, pray, literally to interact with the Lord by switching human wishes or ideas with, for his wishes as he imparts faith, <laughs> divine persuasion. You know, uh, I shared uh, in my Facebook Live yesterday a little bit about faith and how it helps word studies says on faith. It says faith is, that means divine persuasion. It said it's never generated by us. It cannot be produced or um, by human effort. It, it's not about that. God gives us the faith. So really, because we have faith in Jesus, we can commune with him. We can hear him. We can respond to him. And so that's what prayer is, a communion, hearing, responding. So if he's quickened something to you, you've just got, and, and that is different for everybody, maybe quickening a scripture, you may just get a sense to do something. Um, that is uh, another message for another day. But however you feel he leads you is then you need to respond to how he guides and leads you in your day-to-day -day life. It's so simple. That is what prayer is. Now, another message I did, and you will need to watch my, uh, go to my YouTube channel to watch my message on the prayer of faith. And just this is, I wanted to break it down really briefly for you, just to show you uh, a new concept uh, that Jesus was sharing, um, was still while under the old covenant, um, to show them the authority that they had uh, through him. So Mark 11, 22, 24, Jesus answered, and this is just after the fig tree. When Jesus had cursed the fig tree, the next day they found it had died at the roots and they said, look, you know, the fig tree you cursed has died. And Jesus answered or response was, have faith in God. For assuredly, I um, say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, I've broken this down. I think I've done this message for you in church as well. But I am just going to break down verse 25, very, 24, sorry, very briefly with you. In the Greek, the only words you see in the Greek is ask, pray, believe, receive. And for all the definitions and the breakdown of this will be in that message of mine, the prayer of faith. But ask, a teo means to, doesn't mean to ask, Father, you know, is asking him to do something for you. That word means to command, to demand, or to say. Okay, huge mindset shift, isn't it? And then pray, well, I've just gone through that. It's a cumai uh, through communion, pr prayer and praying is hearing and responding. So being led by the spirit, we can put that in uh, new covenant terms. Believe means be persuaded, have confidence in God. It's not about your own faith, building your own faith. God, we know through salvation, God saved us through what he did through Jesus and the finished work. God gives every man a measure of faith. He's put eternity in the heart of every man. So God saves us through his own work. He gives us the faith that we need to respond to him. <laughs> he does all the work for us. And then when we hear that message of salvation, faith springs in our heart. And the only thing we're left to do because we, we believe it is to respond to what Jesus has done. That is the part we play in our salvation. That's it, isn't it? There's nothing else we did. And the Christian life is meant to be exactly the same. God has done everything for us that we need to can just continue to respond. We've already got access to everything, but then with our relationship with God is to, to believe and receive which is to continue to rest in Jesus' finished work is what believing is. 
because God's gifted the faith that you need. Uh, so it's not about because I believe I get healed, but because I have faith in Jesus, I am already healed because Jesus has provided that for me. So another example is I don't need to have faith to become a child of God. Um, so I don't have to build my faith, renew my mind, declare the scriptures in order to become a child of God. No, I heard about the gospel message. I put my faith in Jesus. And because I put my faith in Jesus, I have become a child of God. How? Through what I did? No, but because I believed in Jesus, that's where that transaction took place. So that's how simple faith is. That's how simple salvation is. Now, the word receive, lombano in Greek, it means it doesn't mean that you're waiting there with open arms to, you know, please, you know, <laughs> it means to take, to seize, to grasp, to apprehend, to lay hold of. Okay, so ask means to command, demand or say, receive, I seize, I take, I lay hold of it. You know, so we've got to look past our English uh, definitions and understandings and look to the original and look to what this lines up with everything that Jesus had said to his disciples. And he's so to break that down, uh, that in Mark 11, 22 to 24. So Jesus is saying, whatever you command or demand, it's through, remember, it's through that communion where you've heard and respond to the Father. Be persuaded. It's because you have faith in Jesus, you can do this, right? So you can, because you have faith in Jesus, you can go and lay hold of it. Amen. Now we are post cross. This was spoken pre cross. So we're post cross. We have the finished work. So we can go and take authority over what we face. Jesus said three times here whatever you say, okay, whatever you say to the mountain uh, and you don't doubt in your heart, which means don't judge your heart and your ability there, but believes that those things he says, he will have whatever he says. Okay, so when it comes to that finished work, take authority because you have faith in Jesus. You can do what Jesus did. You can say what Jesus would say is the simple way to put that uh, scripture. Okay, so when it comes to prayer and uh, Jesus finished work, uh, and you hear me say this all the time, you know, we don't need to seek God to, or to ask God or even to pray for what God has already freely provided for us through that finished work. We need to go and Lombano to make use of what he has already freely provided. Okay, so that whole faith uh, connection there with faith and prayer uh, is, we're just going to go through this briefly just to remind you, I just want to continue further, is that building, faith is not about building your faith, uh, but responding to what God has already done. Okay, it's not about your ability but about Jesus' ability. Faith is resting in who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Faith is also not about moving God. Why? Because faith doesn't move God. Prayer doesn't move God. You know, that that is a huge misconception and it's a whole stack of man-made rules and regulations have come from that. Faith and prayer do not move God. God has already moved. He has already responded through what he did through his son. Okay. God already moved on our behalf. I've said here through Jesus and his finished work. So faith in and prayer is also not about asking God to do what he's already done. Example, healing. Healing is not a future tense promise. It's a past tense provision. Okay. So it's about making use of that provision and through our relationship is then being led by him, how we go and take authority and speak to that mountain, if you like, and take authority because we've got authority over our own body. We've got authority over sickness and disease. We've got authority over the adversary and all his work. So come on, we need to learn what we've got. And, uh, and then uh, I've got a simple thing that I remind myself is that information needs to become uh, revelation and that revelation will then help you with that application because that's through that relationship you will know what to do and it's prayer is more about us taking authority back over our own lives than it is us going and seeking God okay so prayer is not God hearing and then responding to us but us going to him, learning uh, to hear his spirit so he can reveal Jesus' finished work to us so that we can then respond accordingly. Amen. I've already covered the, the next point. Prayer and faith is not about God's sovereignty, relying on God's sovereignty, uh, but again, making use of the victory that he's already provided for us. 
And always remember again that saving faith is, it's that simple, it's the way. We didn't save ourselves with the only way, we didn't make any contribution to the salvation of our soul, my friends, but us to, to receive eternal life. The only part we played is, is to make use of the faith that God already gave us. You know, our heart already responded before we uttered a word. Are you with me? In our heart, we responded and yes, you know, and then we, every, every, everything else is history from that point. We responded, it was a heart response. And, uh, you know, nobody has to convince me that I'm not a believer. Nobody has to convince me that I'm not born again. I've already been renewed. I've already been transformed. I've all, already know that truth. You know, for a long time, I had to renew my mind to that because the, all this other teaching, it spoke contrary to that. It, it said that, you know, you know, all this crazy stuff, I'm not going to go through that because I will uh, get sidetracked here. So always bring back faith and prayer to the, the way you experience salvation is that you didn't have to build your faith. You didn't have to pray for hours. You didn't need to intercede. You didn't need to do a bunch of stuff. You didn't need to bind the gates, uh, storm the gates of heaven, bind the gates of hell. You didn't have to pray in tongues for half an hour. You didn't need to study the word and learn the word to become a believer. You heard all about Jesus and his finished work and you responded. Uh, amen. And so through that response that you have access to everything pertaining to God's kingdom. So then now you can enjoy relationship that every day God can guide you and lead you in your life. May the truth set you free, my friends. Okay. So the bottom line is when it comes to what we face in our life, we all want answers, don't we? And so unfortunately, many see prayer as a way to manipulate or to convince God to do something for them. But again, this is the wrong concept of prayer because what does it do? It makes it dependent on us and what we can do. Uh, and it really is an old covenant mindset. Okay, so religion and traditions and doctrines and means that's what religion essentially is, has taught that we've got a huge part to play in prayer. Um, and that we need to ask in order to receive. So going back to remember to that first slide um, is that many believe that they go to God, then God hears and responds and then respond. And when he hears, he's got the three, yes, no, or wait, you know. And so that's that whole prayer cycle that we really need to annihilate in our thinking. Okay, we need to get onto the, the page of the new covenant and where we are now seated uh, that is not new covenant. And as I just showed you in uh, the, just in the prayer of faith summary that ask means to command or demand or say and receive means to seize, to grasp, apprehend, lay hold of it. That is totally new covenant. To partake in what Jesus has done is to go and take what Jesus has done and go make use of it. However, prayer under the model that what we've been taught it breeds i've said here in my notes it breeds insecurity in our relationship with god because if you don't experience an answer um then then where does it leave you you're left doubting you're, you're left feeling unworthy unloved uh you feel well why is god answering everybody around me but not me you know and and, and it just we get into this self-doubting uh cycle and doubt, and I didn't go through it in the prayer of faith, but uh, summary, but I did in the actual message. Doubt is the word diacrino. Dia means through to the other side and uh, um, or across the other side. And crino means judgment in English. So through judgment, but it going through deeper what the definition is, is through discerning and through judging your heart or, or whether you're right or wrong whether you're innocent or guilty whether you're worthy or not worthy whether you're in faith or whether you're not in faith and in that prayer of faith jesus said whoever says to the mountain and does not doubt in his heart so don't judge your heart don't and he's saying don't judge your ability to see whether you're in faith or not whether you're worthy or not uh, or you know um whether you're guilty or not guilty or however you want to look at that he's saying it's all about what you can do because you put your faith in god Okay, so it's not about your ability anyway. So don't make it about your ability. Don't judge yourself that way. Okay, remember Jesus is God's answer to us. He is our yes and amen, which means so be it. So unanswered prayer, just a question mark I've put there. Because when you understand Jesus finished work, um, it's it, it, Father has already answered 
uh, there's a huge mindset shift there and there's a lot of unlearning that we need to do um, and, and that's where we get all these traditions and doctrines of men have come from just even that concept of unanswered prayer and that's why I've put a question mark there so really the the sad reality is because we haven't been taught the new covenant properly is that many judge their relationship with God and their faith and their prayer life based upon their circumstances based upon the answers that they may feel that they've received or haven't received and you know by the daily outcomes so if they've experienced healing right big tick you know I've experienced healing God's answered sweet but if you haven't experienced that healing, then how do you view that? How do you see that? And that's what happens is we start judging. We judge ourselves and look at ourselves and we become introspective or we then uh, judge and blame God. And, and that's the twofold danger of this belief system. So we blame God. So we then start up with that, what I shared at the beginning, that, that God, maybe we haven't prayed right in the first place, so God hasn't heard, so we can't respond, uh, and all those sort of doctrines that come up. Then that whole uh, yes, no, wait, um, which speaks contrary to the finished work of Jesus. And, and then, you know, then you get other things, or maybe it's not God's will, maybe it's not God's timing, maybe he's got another plan. So it's either we blame God or we blame ourselves. And we start going, well, where did I miss that? You know, where did I go wrong? And sometimes that can be kind of helpful sometimes, especially if we were in a whole bunch of self-effort and struggling and striving. I think and if we're honest with ourselves in that place, we can go, well, you know what? I really was doing everything I could, but it's not the end result of that is not really good because it can leave you feeling guilty and condemned and you focus on yourself then and, and what you can do and what you can't do. And both of these is not based on Jesus and his finished work. Okay, so it can become a vicious cycle. And so that's why there's so much teaching. It's from misunderstanding what prayer is in the first place, misunderstanding God's sovereignty, misunderstanding the finished work and our position in it. Um, so it really, you know, I'm still unlearning this myself today. You know, I've been teaching this for probably since two, late 2000s, uh, mid 2000s actually. Um, when were the twins born? 1999, 2000, like, you know, what's it now? <laughs> 20 years. Oh my goodness. You know, and I'm still learning and renewing our, my, my mind and changing the way I think. You know, it's a constant process because religion is so strong in us. Ma religion, man-made rules and traditions, okay, about what God is, what God is, who God is, who God isn't, what prayer is, what prayer isn't, you know, but God's good, isn't he? <laughs> So under that model, under man-made model of what I just shared with you, you know, of that whole prayer cycle is under that definition, it leaves man just, we just believe that we're only partially in control, don't we? Um, and that's why that the sovereignty of God message gets taught. Well, God's sovereign, God's in control. We'll just wait until that outcomes because God will fix it. Uh, so we're left passive and we're le left going, well, when's God going to fix it? Are we going to get that yes answer? Or maybe it's a wait answer. And so can you see that, that, that even just as we process that and think about that, it, it totally bypasses the cross and our position within that kingdom. We're going back under the old covenant, an old covenant mindset. Prayer is not about asking and receiving, not about God hearing and responding. Under the new covenant, it's the relationship, it's communion. It's laying hold of what God has already done for us through Jesus' finished work. And then through that relationship, letting him guide us and lead us in how to take that victory. Okay. So remember with the, again, the sovereignty of God is God has already given us dominion over our own lives, over the fallen world, over the flesh and over the devil. And I'll give you some scriptures on that in a second. And then, uh, then just think of it this way. So if we were meant to ask and receive, okay, if it was about us coming to God and praying and asking him to do something for us, that it kind of contradicts what he said in the Bible. So we saw last uh, the last three lessons on uh, is God in control. We saw in the, those messages that uh, God created us in his image and in his likeness, and he gave us dominion to rule and to reign over all the works of his hands. Once again, he didn't say, I'm going to rule through you, that everything you need, you need to come and ask for me, and then I'm going to decide whether I'm going to give it to you or not. No, he said, here you go, Adam, here's everything you could possibly need. 
uh, then the, the, I give you dominion over it. You to rule and to reign over this system. That's uh, seventh day. God rested because everything was perfect and finished and complete. And that is a type and a picture of what we now have through Jesus' finished work. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, having restored what was lost to us at the fall. However, if God had given us dominion and then that free will to rule and to reign over this earth realm, then why would he set up prayer as a system that we weren't in control of that part of our lives and that we needed to go to him for everything and ask or, you know, petition and beg him? Okay, can you see how it contradicts what God, the authority that God gave to Adam in the garden? Can you see it contradicts the, the authority that Jesus has given us through uh, what we saw in the Gospels and through what we now know through Jesus and his finished work? Remember, prayer, we're not ordering God around because God, prayer doesn't move God. God already moved. We are taking what God has done through the, our God given authority and making use of what. He has freely provided for us. Okay, we already have everything we need through Jesus and his finished work. Okay, you don't believe me? Here is a, a powerful scripture to show you. See, um, old versus new, ask and receive is very much an old covenant mindset. So we've always got to put ourselves back under the finished work of the cross. So I love this scripture. This is Luke 9, verses 13 to 14. This is straight after the Lord's Prayer. Um, the, that's how he begins with the Lord's Prayer, Jesus does. And then he shares about the parable from the friend at midnight. So you'll have to watch Sean's message to rightly divide that. And then uh, he says, you know, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will fi find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And this is the nature and character of the Father. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. Can you see the context there? So where are we? We are post-cross. We already have been given the Holy Spirit. So this is not about your prayer needs. This is not about your daily needs. In fact, if you look at Matthew 6, he, he, he talks about don't worry about your life, what you eat, you drink, you wear, you know, after any of those things, because the Father will already um, have you in mind and he will look after you. And in verse 33, Jesus concludes that by saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. And, and seeking first the kingdom of God, that's Jesus, his righteousness that comes through Jesus. Then all things will be added unto you. Where post cross, we have everything we need in Jesus. Okay, and even when Jesus shared about prayer in Matthew's uh, gospel, he said, the father already knows what you need before you ask. Again, pre-cross to those under the Mosaic law. And then it keeps going, you go further, don't worry about what you eat, you drink, you wear, all that stuff. So we need to rightly divide what we read in the Gospels to, to look at they were Jews still under the Mosaic law. Sometimes he was speaking to the Pharisees. Sometimes he was speaking to the public. Sometimes he was speaking to his disciples. So let's look at the context of that, then remind ourselves which side of the cross that we are on. But I hope you can see the whole asking and receiving in context is about the Holy Spirit. It's about so the gift of the Holy Spirit through him there's because there's only one gift, my friends. I mean, we just break it down as eternal life and as healing, as this, as that, and etc. And we make it this big thing. But there's one gift, it's the Holy Spirit, and through which is the Spirit of Jesus, and through Him we have salvation, which is eternal life, which is healing, deliverance, and we have everything we could possibly need through Jesus and the Spirit of Jesus that now lives in us. Amen. Hope you get that. So when it comes to prayer and Jesus finished work, it should, and you get that understanding, it should totally transform your prayer life. 
and it does it messes you up because you think hang on you go to pray for something you think oh i've got that and you go to pray something else oh i've got that and then i've got that too so what do i pray for then you know so that's why we've really got to unlearn a bunch of stuff and just come to the simple simple truth that prayer is communion and fellowship and that's what the christian life is about and because god's already done everything for us we can enjoy relationship and uh, i'm just going to break that down even further for you so we know what jesus has done but let me break it down but let me remind you what we already have okay so we know we have redemption uh, redemption from sin and death and from sickness and disease so that's me being redeemed from fallen flesh galatians 3 13 tells us we've been redeemed from the law of sin and death and just that whole sin and you die um we know that we were all born dead in adam because death ended through sin and that's all in romans 5 and but through the last adam we have life you know so in adam we died in jesus we live so we've been redeemed from that curse of the law of sin and death and the, the, the curse of death that came in as the consequence of what Adam did in the garden. Um, and we've also been redeemed from sickness and disease. Isaiah 53 tells us he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows. And when you look in the Hebrews, it's talking about physical, emotional and mental pain and anguish and torment. That Jesus has paid the price for it, for it all. So he's overcome, he's redeemed us from sin and the flesh and sickness and disease is a part of that. And he's also redeemed us from the fallen world. 1 John 5, 4 says the victory we have over this world is because we have faith in Jesus. Um, and then Colossians 1, uh, 13 to 14 says that we have been delivered, past tense, out of the dominion and the control of darkness. And we have been translated into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of sins. And I've just quoted the Amplified Classic Edition there, that we have been delivered. Salvation means deliverance, breaking it down, deliverance from all of your enemies. That's what Jesus did for us. So we've been redeemed. We also have reconciliation and that's, you know, at Christmas time, you hear goodwill and peace towards all men. And I love that because that's what Jesus brought for us. Peace with God, you know, goodwill. God has a goodwill towards mankind and, and his plans are only to prosper us, not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future. You know, I love that. I read out this all the time. So you can read this in your own time in the, Amplify classic edition of 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 or even 16 to 19. We know that God, uh, he reconciled and restored the world to favor with himself. He no longer counts up our sin against us, but he's canceled it. And he's given us that message of reconciliation, which means the restoration to favor. Or we have peace with God, not based upon what we do, but all because of what Jesus has done. And because we put our faith in Jesus, we become beneficiaries or partakers of that divine nature and what Jesus has freely provided. Okay, so um, redemption, we've been delivered and redeemed from the, the world, the flesh and the devil. And that's the three main reasons why we suffer, because we live in a fallen world with fallen men and there's an adversary. But Jesus has given us, he's disarmed it and given us authority, hasn't he, over that. So we have redemption, rec reconciliation, which is peace and favor with God and res restoration, which is all part of that as well, isn't it? But just to break it down is that essentially Jesus restored everything that was lost at that fall. Uh, we know Satan became the God of this world. Uh, 1 John uh, 5, 9, 5, 8 to 9, it says that we know that, um, oh, I think it's 5, 19, 5, 19 that we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. God, so when people say God is in control, it's like, no, 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 you, you ain't read your Bible. <laughs> God is not in control. Satan the, is, he's been sinning from the beginning and uh, the whole world is under his control. But through what we have in Jesus, we have power over his power. Uh, I covered that in is God in control message. So you can watch those in your own time. So we have restoration that Jesus, remember, is the last Adam that redeemed us from everything that first Adam brought upon us. 
And the other thing we have through Jesus finished work, and this is so powerful, is resurrection life and power. Okay, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me, lives in you. The moment you said yes to Jesus, you were sealed with that spirit of promise. Amen. You have salvation. You have redemption. You have reconciliation. You have restoration because you believe in Jesus. You know, and, and again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that we are now new creations. The old fallen nature is, has gone. We were, Romans 6, Paul says, we were dead and we were buried with Christ. We've now been raised to a new life. That through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we have been equipped and empowered with everything we need for a life worth living. Amen. Life and life abundantly. Okay, so... Faith in Jesus' finished work then. So it's not about just uh, trusting in what Jesus has done for us. There's another part, and this is how we kind of make use of it as well. So I've said here, faith in Jesus' resurrection isn't just a belief or you resting in that God has raised Jesus from the dead. It is your identity. It's about you identifying that you too died with Christ. You too were buried with him. Your old life is still in the left in the grave. Don't resurrect it, my friends. Don't resurrect a fallen nature. Don't resurrect your past. Uh, you know, is leave it in the grave where Jesus left it. When he was raised from the dead, if you're in him, you have been raised to a new life too. That is why Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6, we are seated with him in heavenly places. Okay, as new covenant believers, we've got the wrong identity. We really do. That's our main problem. We're mixing uh, the covenants and we just uh, keep putting ourselves under that old covenant. But to, to just to um, flesh out that first point there for you is that remember, Jesus took all your sin, your pain, your sickness, your disease, your emotional pain, your guilt, your shame and condemnation and all lack. He took it to the cross on your behalf and he died to it. He was then buried and he left that all in the grave. Amen. So God then resurrected Jesus from the dead, gave him new life glorified body and then seated him at his right hand this is us this is what we now have in jesus we need to constantly remind ourselves who he is an inner in us who we are in him amen so don't have the wrong identity jesus sees us sees you a hundred percent forgiven healed delivered and made whole but we are only as free as our belief system. And because of all the man-made traditions and doctrines, you know, that are out there is that it prevents us from understanding this truth and, and living in this truth. That's why we're only as, as free as our belief system. So we begin to experience more of the manifestation of this as our mind is renewed and because our identity changes. Okay, we start, we start overcoming condemnation. We start overcoming guilt when we know that who we are in Jesus. And that does apply for other areas as well. Okay, so I've got a simple graphic just to break it down again. And I know I'm saying the same thing 20 minutes in different ways, but I just pray that I'll just share it in one way that you might really connect with. But I hope this is just um, laying down these foundations line upon line you know, precept upon precept for you. So in a nutshell, when it comes to the old covenant focused versus a new covenant focused, um, the old covenant was all about promises that will be fulfilled in the future, a future tense. But for us under the new covenant, because the cross, because of what Jesus has done, uh, everything Jesus did is not a future tense promise. It's a past tense provision. So the old covenant, so when this comes to faith, when this comes to your prayer life, when this comes to your relationship with God, if you have an old covenant mindset, you're thinking God's will do. But if you filter through the cross, you'll realize that God has already done everything through Jesus. Okay, so essentially the old covenant mindset is you're walking towards uh, the cross, you're walking towards what God's going to do. Okay, and this all provides a lack mentality and we'll go through that in a second. 
okay? But when you know who you are in Christ, you're walking from the cross. We are seated with him in heavenly places. We don't have to fight or strive or labor for what God has already done for us through his son. Okay, we need just continued revelation on that finished work. Okay, so we just got to, when we go through something in life, we've just got to center ourselves. You know, even if you can go to this message and come and find this slide and pause it and go, well, where am I at right now? How am I thinking right now? Which side have I put myself on today? What, am, where's my thinking at? So then you can then go, whoops, okay, Jesus, you're the enough for me. Okay. <laughs> Because if you don't, if you stay on that wrong side, there is that lack mentality. And that is the sad reality, once again, that many people are still petitioning God and begging God to do what he's already done. And because we've been taught that prayer moves God, faith moves God. And so and that's that whole ask and receive mentality, which is old covenant focused. And, and so old covenant, you know, it was speaking to a, a group of um people the israelites who were classed as children unskilled in the way of righteousness they were kept under the tutor or the schoolmaster until the way of faith could come you know and by and large they were disobedient they really didn't want a relationship with god they continued to bow down and serve and worship other gods you know so it, it's it's just a completely different system Okay, they didn't have the power and the authority that we now have through Jesus. So when we look at different accounts in the Bible, be careful that before you start to apply it to your life, yes, we can learn and grow from these accounts, but before you apply it to your life, look at it through the new covenant lens. Okay, so unfortunately, many people, because they don't know this truth, they're still left asking and begging and petitioning God to do what he's already done. But let's go back to the beginning again. Adam in the garden had no needs or wants. Everything was provided for him. And that real lie, the real deception there was Satan deceived Adam and caused him to have a lack mentality, you know, deceived him into believing that he was missing something, that was something more to be gained. Okay, so, you know, he started to desire after something that he already had. He was already created in the very image and likeness of God. And so, you know, We've gone through that uh, many times. So no, I don't need to cover that in detail here now. But that's essentially what happened. So Adam was caused and left with, because he took his eyes off, Jesus, off the finished work of the father, the Sabbath rest, he took his eyes off that. And then just, yeah, and then we know the rest was history. Okay, so that the biggest deception for us, both for us post-cross, sorry, is that we take our eyes off Jesus and his finished work. And that does then put us on the wrong side. We start striving and we start feeling desperate. We start feeling guilty and condemned. And we're just left with this, you know, desire and emptiness of like, how do I get God to move? How do I get God to respond to this need? You know, and it, that's a lack mentality. And it's, it is a big deception because then we bypass the cross Okay, and we start desiring for what is freely provided already for us, you know, and, and, and the garden and then what we have now through Jesus finished work, God took care of everything, you know, the finished work, it, it, you hear me say it's a perfect, complete, and it is a finished work that not one area was left undealt with. Uh, Jesus is God's yes answer for everything we face in this fallen world. Okay, and he did that. Why? So that we can continue just to simply have relationship with him. Communion is hearing and responding, spending time with him, knowing he we have peace with God, knowing that we can exist every day with a relationship with the creator of the universe, with the lover of our soul, you know, uh, and, and I think it's so simple. The Christian life is simple but it's been messed up by so many traditions and doctrines of men. And God is good. When you come to know that truth, the truth makes you free. Always remember God already knows what you need before you ask. And because remember again, and also God is not reactive. He is proactive. He's already responded. So we've got to get that reactive. God is reactive mindset out of our vocabulary and thinking and realize God is proactive before we were even born. God responded when he sent his son into this world. Amen.
Okay, so these I've got another couple of slides just to break down that finished work for you and show you what we the difference between the two covenants there through the old man and what we have through the new man. Okay, remember the old covenant was all works based. It was based upon the children of Israel and their performance. They had to keep the whole law. But uh, that law, what was it called? The law of sin and death. But Jesus has redeemed us from that. He made the way for a new covenant. And the new covenant is we put our faith in Jesus and what he did on that cross for us. So the difference between those two covenants, the, the old covenants was works based system on the works of your flesh to perform. Okay, it was a performance based system, whereas the new covenant is based upon Jesus' performance. Okay, he did all the work, we put our trust and we then rest in what he's done. Okay, and so under the old covenant was about labor, striving, and lusting because you're left with this um, uh, lack mentality, trying to get what you've already got. Um, well, they didn't have it yet. They could in the father in their relationship, but they really didn't understand faith. So they were under that workspace system. But what we have under the new covenant is we are now resting in what Jesus has done for us. We are seated with him in heavenly places. We don't have to bind the gates of hell, storm the gates of heaven, all that binding and loosing and all that stuff. That, that is an old covenant concept. And actually it had to do with spreading the gospel. Okay. So Jesus has already done the binding and loosing for us through his finished work that we can go and lay hold of what he has done. Okay, again, the old covenant, it was sin, all about you sin and you die, that whole system. So you ended up with a sin consciousness. So for us, it's about, so it was under sin and you die under the old covenant. The new covenant is believe and you live. Okay, it's, so the old covenant, you had a sin consciousness but under the new covenant, we have a Christ consciousness. You know, it's about Jesus. Remember, you no longer identify in Adam. You need to identify in Jesus. Okay, we were dead in Adam, but we've now been made alive through Jesus. Amen. Under the old covenant, the blessings were conditional. You know, if you follow my commands, if you do everything I say, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My statues, my decrees, everything. But under the new covenant, it was freely given. Ephesians 1, 3 says, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ in heavenly places. We have his power. We have his authority. We have the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead in us. We're sealed with that spirit. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4 says that God has already given us everything we need for life and godliness. Amen. We have everything we need through Jesus when did that take place? The moment we put our faith in Jesus. Amen. It was an instant tra transaction, but it's taking a lifetime for us to catch up to that truth. Old covenant was about give and then you receive. New covenant's all about give because you have received. Example, forgiven. Old covenant was forgive to be forgiven. And new covenant is we forgive because we've been freely forgiven. And it's and always remember the cross in the middle that is through the ministry now, through Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, the giving of his very spirit. It's through his indwelling spirit that we are equipped and empowered. You know, through that gift, we can then release forgiveness. We can release provision. We can release healing. We can re release not only to ourselves, Sometimes we need to forgive ourselves, but other people as well. So don't try and do anything in your own self-effort because you won't make it. You're only as good as your behavior there. So again, the old covenant was about asking God to respond, to do something for you under the new covenant. God has done it all through that cross that we now, it's about hearing and then responding. So God, and when I say hearing and responding, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit is to equip Jesus, um, sorry, to remind us what Jesus has done, sorry, um, that we are already equipped, that we are already empowered. Jesus has disarmed and done everything for us. So then he can remind us and reveal Jesus' finished work to us so that we can go and respond accordingly. Okay. And that is about the prayer of faith, if you want to put a label to it, is about going and saying to that mountain of sickness and saying to the mountain of debt, get off my life, you know, taking authority over it and, uh, and then declaring healing, 
And then also through your relationship with God, letting him guide you and lead you in the choices you make in the future. And if you do need any other um, assistance in that um, as well. Okay, so just have an ear to hear how he leads us. Again, the old covenant, what we had in Adam and what we now have in Jesus. This is even just in my original slide that I did years ago. I had this over the top of the other slide. I just felt it looked a bit too complicated. So I've just made it really simple for you. And, uh, and I shared, I think I share this sort of concept in all my messages, don't I? So under the old covenant and under, especially under the Mosaic law, you're a sinner because sinning is breaking the commands of God. But under the new covenant, we have been made righteous. You know, uh, we were all born dead in Adam, but we've all been made alive in Jesus. Sin was imputed under the law. Imputed means charged to your account. The law of sin and you incur the death penalty, the law of sin and death. New covenant is believe and live. Okay, you believe in Jesus. He imputes charges to your account. Righteousness, not your righteousness. His righteousness is gifted to you. How? Through the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is holy, righteous. It is Jesus himself. Okay, so he equips and empowers us with what we need for life and for godliness. Okay, so in Adam, we were dead. In Jesus, obvious, isn't it? We have been made alive. Old covenant was all about obedience. And when you break that down, I have done messages on this. Obedience actually does mean to hear and respond. Okay, not listen and do, but hearing and responding. God said, if you hear and listen to my voice, then you've kept my covenant. Okay, he didn't say if you hear, then do. If you really heard what I'm saying, that's how you keep my covenant. Why? Because it's about believing in him. Jesus said, you know, he, he was asked the question when a group of people realized that he was the Messiah. They said, well, then what do we do now? What do we do that may, we may do the works of God? And he says, this is the works of God. Believe in the father and believe in the son whom he sent. Okay, so obedience to the gospel, obedience to the good news, believe in Jesus. So the old covenant was about obedience. The new covenant is all about our, our identity. Okay, so we're not sin conscious, we're Christ conscious. The cross, if we just go through the cross and stay on our right side of our covenant, we'll be right. Okay, so the new covenant is all about Jesus and nothing. He is more than enough for us. Okay. I hope you're not getting sick of me sharing the same thing with you every week, but I need to hear this too. I'm preaching to myself here. The finished work is everything to me. It really is. And it's like every day I just remind myself of what I've already got and it just sets you free from works. It sets you free from all the stuff and the, the traditions and the doctrines of men and the duty and the expectations where you can just enjoy relationship. Uh, with the father every day so always remember because of what jesus did through the finished work of the cross every answer to every prayer need you could ever possibly had was made through that cross for you god foresaw every sin pain sickness disease shame in your life even before you were born Amen. Before you were born, he saw it and he dealt with it and he responded it because he's not reactive. He is proactive. Jesus has redeemed you from the fallen world. And when you believed in him, you received the inheritance of the Holy Spirit. And through him, you became a new creation. And through him, he has and he continues to equip and empower you with everything of who the father is, with everything of who Jesus is, you have access to all of that because the kingdom now lives in you. So you now have everything you need for life and for godliness. It is so simple, isn't it? So the Christian life is now therefore, and your prayer life and your faith life is not about getting God to move. Okay, but learning about what God has already done when he moved, when he sent his son to die on the cross. The Christian life is about discovering, learning, not earning. It's not about earning. Faith and prayer isn't about, prayer isn't about earning, but learning what we already have. Communing with him, letting the Holy Spirit reveal Jesus, what taking from what belongs to Jesus, making it known to us. 
Okay, so the Holy Spirit is that minister of that new covenant to us. He is the power of God. He is the presence of God. It is the spirit of God's son who was shed abroad in our hearts that we can cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. We are children of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus, seated with him in heavenly places. Amen. It's good news. Amen. So understanding the finished work, hopefully it'll totally transform your prayer life from this point forwards. Because if you understand the finished work of the cross, you will then know God has already moved. God has already responded. God has already provided you with everything you need in life. You're equipped. You have everything you could possibly need. I can say it a hundred times. We And I'll say it a hundred times more. We need to be established in that truth. So my friends, go and lumbano, seize, grasp, apprehend, make use of what Jesus has done for you. We need to change and renew our mind and thinking and be on guard and don't let anyone deceive you and put you back under the wrong side of the cross. Don't let anybody get you into methods and formulas of prayer, you know, to try and get God to move. Get out of the lack mentality and get on the provision mentality. And Jesus is your provision in every area of life. Amen.